Welcome back to Ego Criticism 101, lecture number 11. So lecture number 10 was on the Renaissance, early modern period. Lecture 11 is going to be on the early modern period. The difference is while we dealt with some sort of philosophical and theological issues there, like the emergence of Christian stewardship and the idea that we can have many different subject positions uh, with respect to the environment, here we're going to look at literature itself in the period, so-called Renaissance literature. And you might, I don't know, sigh when you hear that, thinking, oh, great, we're going to read some, you know, poetry about, you know, nature in the period. How important is that really? Well, the argument I'm going to make is it's very important. And the reason is, well, before you took this course, you might have imagined that it was, you know, of course, the literature and the environment. It was going to be all about poems and, and other things celebrating that. So one example would be I don't know, Wordsworth's Daffodils. Wordsworth writing about the same time, a little before Thoreau, but in England, loves nature, celebrates nature. Daffodils is about daffodils. Daffodils in the Lake District of England, a beautiful bucolic place that Wordsworth never tires writing about. He actually lived there for a while, um, the later part of his life. So the thing is about that, though, is in many ways our attitude toward nature will be consolidated in the 19th century by people like Wordsworth, Thoreau, John Muir toward the end of the century. And we might just assume that, you know, nature is beautiful and inviting. And when we think about beautiful, perfect nature, we'll think about the things that those writers wrote about, whether it's Daffodils with Wordsworth or whether it's Yosemite Valley with um, John Muir. But the fact is that's not the, the way that people thought about nature, you know, 300, 400 years before. A shift has happened and it happens in the early modern period, both the nature is more inviting, but also to work out how to represent it, how to write about it, how to communicate what it is to people. And we're going to look at that today. So it's very important because it, it both explains how the later literature came to be and how it works. But more importantly, I think it explains where our attitudes toward nature begin to come from. We might, you know, think that we're born appreciating something like the Yosemite Valley. And in certain ways, I, I would accept an argument that we are, but a lot of it is, you know, shifts in, in cultural conventions, and, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. So let's jump right in and look at our Prezi. Here we are, and let's go right into here. Notice we're still in the Renaissance, and we will be even the beginning of the next lecture, but here we are. First thing we're going to look at is Cooper's Hill by Sir John Denham. And let's jump right in here. You may have never heard of John Denham before uh, this class. Uh, he is uh, one of the most popular poets in the 17th century. And that's actually something worth pausing on for a moment. We think we know who the popular writers are at the time. So we've done like Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton. Um, actually, those three were popular at the time. But not every writer that we read was. Amelia Lanier certainly was obscure at the time. Uh, so what... You know, the taste at the time and, and the perception at the time of what was important will vary. And we tend to forget that because literary scholars often focus on things that weren't what was focused on at the time. Um, the reason this poem was so popular, um, so it gets reprinted quite a few times, is that in the middle of it, it talks about the beheading of Charles I. This was a major major event, the culmination of the British Civil War in the 1640s. And it's astonishing that the people actually, you know, got together and killed the king. How do you go and kill a king? A king's supposed to be in part divine. So um, this is going to be a, a depiction of that. So people were interested in Denham, by the way, was a, a loyalist. He was on the side of the king. So it's a, it's a, that portrayal is particularly um, poignant for him. So, but that's not why we're interested in it. Um, we're interested in it because it's the first and important term here, loco descriptive. Um, so uh, loco, we've had the word before, um, means place. 
And descriptive obviously means descriptive. So what's going to happen here, and, and these are often also called, and I put the term here, typographical, topographical, because again, they are sort of describing a locale. What does local descriptive poetry do? It provides a lush description of a place. It's going to become enormously popular. So when we get to Wordsworth, that's going to be his main thing. And we'll talk about how this works in a moment. But it's characterized by lush and increasingly lush descriptions, lavish descriptions, elaborate detailed descriptions of the environment. And it will become enormously popular. And if you were to trace back where local descriptive uh, literature in the sense of environmental literature begins in English language, yeah, you're going to get to Cooper's Hill in an unlikely way. There, there are other works that have a claim to it. No work really exists in a vacuum. There are things that happened before it. But this is a very important poem that will be referenced by people like Wordsworth. They all knew it, and you know, it kicks off something that inspired them. So, um, local descriptive poetry uh, comes on the scene as country house poems die out. So, remember with Amelia Lanyard and Ben Johnson, we had the birth of so-called country house poetry, although a far better description is country estate poetry. Um, the thing about that, though, if you think of it from the perspective of an artist or a writer, it's a very limited um, genre. What I mean by that is you are limited to writing about or painting um, the patron's estate generally. So someone pays you money instead of painting, you know, a picture of their, their child to hang on the wall. You go ahead and you write a, a local descriptive poem about, I'm sorry, you write a um, country estate poem about their estate. And that's how you did it. But now here's the problem. What if you wanted to write about other features of the environment? What if you saw a beautiful mountain you wanted to write about? Well, no one's going to pay you to do that, unfortunately. And that shows sort of the limits of patronage. I mean, maybe you'd get a patron who would be interested in it. But for the most part, um, these country estate poems were very limited in that sense. So we're going to see local descriptive literature, and it has to do with a shift, and we can see it right here with Sir John Denham, a shift happening in basically how, how writing is financed, or more to the point, how writers make their money. So, yep, um, it's, it's generally local descriptive literature, a form of pastoral, at least broadly put, um, but it's going to sometimes and ultimately eschew the conventions of pastoral poetry. So um, pastoral, yes, but don't necessarily expect to find pastures and, and shepherds and sheep in it. They may be there, but it's, it's going to move away from it. It's still going to be, in, in a broad sense, an idealized view of the environment, an idealized view of the country in particular, often in opposition to the city. And that's going to be there. So in that sense, it's pastoral. But in the sense that pastoral, you, know, you had to check all the boxes, you know, shepherd, sheep, and like that, pastures, you, you don't do that here necessarily. Um, the main thing is though it's going to be preoccupied with the countryside and, and gesturing toward it. I'm going to talk about that gesture. We had it before with pastoral, but we'll do it a little more here. It is, however, um, in this very early form uh, with Cooper's Hill, the case that so John Denham is being is deploying, and we'll get into this more. You know, um, this loco descriptive approach and lush descriptions here. But it's not limited just to the environment. So I, you wouldn't necessarily call this an environmental poem. Why? In part because he's talking, as I note here, about St. Paul's Cathedral in London, Windsor's Castle, St. Anne's Hill. Um, there are things here, to, you know, discussion of the Thames, the river, Windsor Forest, but it's all mixed up here. So um, we, we will ultimately, if we continued on in the 21st century poetry of this sort, get people talking about the city and all as well in the 20th century. But here we're really um, talking about a whole range of things. So I just want to be clear that, yes, it is local descriptive and pastoral, but because it's an early version of this, it's, a, it's kind of a hodgepodge of things. Um, 
you know, unlike denim, however, in a very in the the signature pastoral turn, local descriptive poets and artists of all sorts are going to turn away from the city. So we saw that with pastoral. These are people who who live in the city and they don't write about the city. They turn their gaze to the countryside, where they often spend time when they have country homes and all. So that signature term turn away from the city and its problems, and ultimately the problems of modernity over time. Time. And what I mean by that is you have people like Wordsworth writing in an era of, you know, if, if you were to characterize Wordsworth's era, the first half of the 19th century, you would probably, in England, you, you know, as a historian, you would probably characterize it as the era of the growth of the so-called Industrial Revolution, the emergence of towns like, you know, Manchester and all huge factories. Um, it, Wordsworth doesn't write about any of that. He's not interested in modernity. He's looking at a simpler time, pre-modernity and all. So that's going to be happening here too, but it's, it's a very pastoral turn. Um, and writers then, and Wordsworth would be an example, is going to completely ignore, ignore um, urban areas, or for the most part ignore them, and instead give us a very sort of over-the-top fetishized view of um, untouched nature, or, or relatively untouched nature. What he would like to say is untouched nature, but we now know isn't quite. Um, this is the actual view from Cooper's Hill, and um, including Windsor Castle up here, and London would be far in the distance. It's uh, if you were to go to Cooper's Hill today, it's still there. You probably won't be able to see London because of the air pollution problem. It would have been intriguing, and I I, I, I don't know if anyone did this to go up to Cooper's Hill uh, during COVID, at least initially in COVID, when people took quarantining very seriously, and um, cities all over the planet during COVID became clearer. The skies became clearer because there was less point source pollution coming from cars and, and and I'm not sure if if London would have finally after all these after four centuries or so become visible at that point in time but it, it was at this point if denim is to believed um, here's an interesting point about this and you can kind of see it visually here we're up on top of a hill here and we're looking down at Windsor Castle at London you could look at the Thames and you could look at other things so this is what the hill why this is called a hill poem because you're up at the hill on top of a hill looking down at what you can see from the hill the point of calling it a hill poem that's the vantage point it is not however about the hill so it's kind of almost paradoxical that you know you have this genre called hill poems you'd assume they're poems about hills but they're not uh, they're about the vantage point from a hill. It's an important distinction, one that one could imagine showing up on an exam for sure. Um, again, hill poems are not about hills. They're about what you can see from hills. And it becomes enormously popular, and it'll, it'll go roaring into Wordsworth's era and the era of you know, romanticizing the environment. Um, then, it die, then it too, like the country estate poem, will ultimately die out. So let's talk about local descriptive literature and what this means. Local descriptive literature is, not surprisingly, very descriptive. So here's the issue. In order to sort of capture a landscape, and I note here between the boards of the book, um, people, you know, writers from the early modern period onward are going to require lush, are going to use lush descriptions of the environment that's more representational. So what do I mean by that? If you open a book and so actually say you have a friend next to you open a book and start reading and you close your eyes just based on what you are hearing, can you imagine the locale, the place being described? To do that, to have that little project, that experiment work successfully, you would want a work of literature that really described in detail what you were seeing. So if your eyes were closed and you're thinking, what does the sky look like? And you get a poem that has, you know, 15 lines describing the sky and clouds and a bird flying through it, that would work. If you didn't have much description, if the author just said the, you know, the blue sky, that's not going to help you much. Um, for this to be successful, you need lots of description. And that's what we're going to see emerging here. And that's, that's sort of the cornerstone of what local descriptive is. It's that lush description. 
Um, it's, nature poetry is becoming more representational is another way of putting it. What is that description that's representation? Um, if you look back at the literature that we've seen already, and if you go to, say, the description of nature in Chaucer, or even more recently, what we had last uh, lecture in Ben Jonson, you're not going to see very much description at all. In fact, very little mimesis is being employed here. Mimesis is the Greek word, and it's, it's the word for representation. And what I mean by that is when you look at, say, Ben Jonson's description in Penshurst, yeah, there's description of of different features but there's not a lot so you you see there's a, a forest but you don't get much detail on what that forest is like the the things are mentioned there but we'll see it compared to something that comes later like upon Appleton House where there's a lot more description we call that mimesis if if a text is more representational there's more mimesis going on mimesis is a complicated subject we don't have to get into a great um, deal of detail detail here, but mimesis is just representation. Um, so increasingly with, with this more lush description of local descriptive literature, mimesis is going to be employed more and more. Um, these works, the earlier works, if they're not employing mimesis, well, how are they working? Well, they're uh, generally employing gestures rather than representation to the environment. Um, so how does this work? If you could actually visit a place, then representation and lush description becomes less important. So go back to that same uh, little experiment, uh, friends reading from a poem, you have your eyes closed. If it's a place that you know, you don't really need a lot of description because when you close your eyes, hopefully you can kind of, you know, if a place you, you know well, and hey, if you're a patron and you commissioned a poem about your estate, you would probably know it pretty well. And if, you know, the description was, you know, um, the red sky at night, well, that's not much of a description, right? Or red sky at dusk, say. That's not much of a description. There's really very little there. But if you've lived at that place and you've seen hundreds of red skies at night, suddenly, you know, images would explode in your head, but they're not, they're not put there by the writer. They're put there by the environment, and you just have to just, and the writer's just gesturing toward it. Let me explain this a little more. So think about Penshurst, the poem, if you went back and read it. It's, it works kind of like a guide, like a human guide, a nature guide walking beside you, making gestures con uh, at each point. So look over there, the broad beech and the chestnut. Look, the purple pheasant with the speckled sides. Look, the painted partridge lies in every field. Well, these aren't very descriptive terms. So um, the painted partridge... Um, that's that's a one word, you know, descriptor there, an adjective, paint it. That, that if you had never visited this locale, so say someone is writing about a place where you've never been, where plants and animals are very different, you don't even quite know what a partridge is, you're not going to have a very good image of what that partridge is like. But if indeed there's a partridge in every field, and this is your estate, you probably know exactly what partridges look like. And when you get that reference, that you know, that one word painted, then suddenly you know you know the author is drawing attention to one aspect how these partridges look. Presumably, if your eyes are closed, you know you have an explosion of of images in your head. That's because you have been to the place and you know the place. But then the challenge will become: What if you've never visited the place? What if it's some really you know place far away that you've never visited? Um, how do you then get that represented? Um, yeah, but what's more important here than the description? So, say the um, in this case the pheasant being purple, um, but what's gestured to. Um, consequently, it's better for these works, and Johnson well knows this, not to become overly descriptive because First, you don't need to. You know, the um, Robert Sidney, the guy that owned the estate described into Penshurst, 
He didn't need anything more than one word to describe the pheasant. But if you do, it would be kind of annoying, right? So say you're walking at a um, with a nature guide, and ideally I think the person would say, look at that partridge over there, look at that pheasant over there, and then your attention would be there, and hopefully if you're being mindful and in the moment, you would, you would see that partridge and you know exactly how it fit in with your own eyes. But if then the person just started going lush, lush descriptions Look at the purpleness against the sky and the blueness against the grass. It might just become annoying. So writers, one, they don't need to do that because you actually have the images in your head. But two, it risks being kind of kind of annoying and intrusive, I would say. Yeah. Um, it would, would ultimately be not just annoying but but counterproductive. It would um, – it, it's, it's – putting an image in a, in a person's head where there's no need to have that image, uh, where that, the image is already there, so there's no need to go to the work of putting it there. I say counterproductive because people have their own ideas of something like this, right? And your notion of a pheasant or a partridge is your own and, and your ideas are, are your own. And to try to force another idea in there, another image in there, might ultimately be counterproductive. It might be a little confusing. It, it, the, in fact, the um, person reading it might actually take, um, now not take offense, but, but be confused or, you know, so if their image of what a partridge and the one that you're giving them are at odds, suddenly that would become an issue. And that issue, probably one you don't want uh, a reader to be, to be dealing with if you're an author. You'd rather them deal with the overall project rather than focusing them on the detail like that. Um, the difference is, and this is an important difference, local descriptive literature attempts and the poets to describe what may never be visited. Some literature from the early modern period onward is becoming more representational and less gestural. It's going to have more and more description. Mimesis is going to be employed more and more, as the imagined reader may not, as far as the author is concerned, ever visit the locale. And um, one of the reasons that and we'll get to this, that Sir John Denham can do this is because he's not relying on a patron anymore. He's, he's selling this book. So um, you don't have to, to worry about that. And, and increasingly, as the colonial project will kick up, then, you know, you have people writing about all these, you know, far reaches of the earth where the, you know, British Empire is moving. And there may be entirely different sorts of animals there. So, you know, how do you describe a giraffe to someone who has never seen a giraffe. You can't just say the spotted giraffe. That's not going to work. Um, it would if you lived in the place where there are lots of giraffes. But for you know, for a British uh, um, you know reader at this period of time, that wouldn't work at all. So you have to do what you have to describe and use lots of description. You know, it can be argued, it has been, that what these writers then are doing is actually sort of creating an environment in the text itself. If you've never visited the place where there are things like giraffes, that, that whole environment, that everything around there is going to be different. The plants are going to be different. The feeling of the air is going to be different. Sunsets will even be different. So, you know, to do that then, it creates a great challenge for the writer. You can't just say, ah, the spotted giraffe, it doesn't work. You have to then really describe what's there in great detail. That might come, you might think, well, that's that's just what writers do, um, you know, and, and in fact, many of the novels you've read, and most novels, and especially as description really comes roaring in and through the 20th century, do that. But that's not, you know, inherently the way people write. That's the kind of writing that really has come on the scene in, um, comes on the scene in this period in a big way. And from our somewhat limited view, environmentally, it's very, very important. It's important. Description will be important for all sorts of things. But for, you know, the, the project of literally describing an environment or gesturing to or, or more broadly getting a, um, a reader interested in and conveying things about an environment, description is going to become huge. So I want to talk about this, not in terms just of writing, but uh, in terms of um, painters as well. So 
all artists have this difficulty or have this challenge of, you know, if you're painting something that someone hadn't seen before, how do you do it? Right around this time, right around Shakespeare's time, a little before landscape actually first enters, the word landscape enters the English language. And it's in part because a series of writer, uh, painters, principally Dutch painters, are painting landscapes. They're painting, and again, you might think that's a, a mainstay of painting, but really it becomes, and we'll see in a certain kind of way, uh, very important this era and takes on features of what we'll, we'll think of as modern landscape. Landscape. So again, the early modern period, if you're going back and do, we're just doing art history, we're going to do a little bit in a moment, um, you know, you're wondering where landscape comes from. It, this is the early modern emergence of landscape. Um, and, you know, the challenge is for artists as for writers is how do you represent uh, a landscape? So let's go into local descriptive literature a little more, but really the, the project of describing a landscape. So Prior to the Renaissance, and let's talk about the medieval period, even just a little before um, this period, um, you're going to see people depicting the landscape, true enough, in works, but not very accurately. So let me give you an example of what something like this would look like. This is the year 1500. You could argue the, the very beginning of the English Renaissance. This is the hunt of the unicorn. The important thing to note here is that these people, men, are actually in a forest hunting a unicorn. Well, this is not a very accurate looking forest. I mean, the guys there are as tall as trees. The forest is there almost as like setting to let you know that they're in a forest. But all the action, all that the, the painter cared about here for the most part is the human action, this hunt going on. The landscape, the environment is, is not very uh, important, certainly not central. Let me give you another example. This is the crucifixion of St. Peter with the donor from 1450, a little before. This is set outside in an environment. But, you know, everything here first is very symbolic, right? And, you know, you have a church, you have a town, you have uh, St. Peter here with the donor. Um, is there an effort to depict something like, you know, that the rock formations here, is it green? Yeah, that's to let you know that it is in fact set outside and all. But the proportions are wrong for all this. Um, it doesn't look accurately what like something like this would look like um, because there's no real, there's not a great deal of concern for it. The concern here is with what the human action, what's taking place there this event. The fact that, you know, um, allegorically, the church is in the background here, and it's important, it sort of has to be. Um, but again, the environment, um, one, not very important in this scene. The important thing is the human action. And two, very little effort is given to accurately represent it. It's just there to let you know that it's there, basically. So um, you're going to see, I mentioned landscape comes on, the, the word comes into um, being in English because these principally Dutch painters are doing landscape painting. Peter Bruegel would be an example, important example. And what would one of these look like? Well, here we are at 1565, right? Just a few decades after the hunt of the unicorn. But look at this. Um, first, the landscape is occupying most of the painting. So if you were to digitize and, and look at the percentage of the film, uh, percentage of the scene, you know, the number of pixels taken up by people, very small percentage, I would argue probably much less than 10% of the entire scene. The entire scene is here. Is there a focus on human beings and human action here? Yes. This is about harvesters. There they are doing what they're doing. So this is an early, um, you know, landscape. And as such, it's still kind of like the two paintings we just saw, the earlier ones. You know, they're anthropocentric. It's centered on human action. But on the other hand, you can see the landscape has come roaring in here. And that landscape is not broadly speaking, symbolic, but rather meant to look like a literal landscape. This is what, you know, it would look like for harvesters. So 
here's the difference between this painting and the two you saw before. If someone had never been to this part of the world and had never seen people harvesting, uh, this looks like wheat or something, you know, would this be, would this give them a pretty adequate um, vision of what that's like? And, and I would argue, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty accurate way of, of imagining that. If you had given the hunt of the unicorn to someone and said, you know, I know you'd never been to this part of the world. This is what a forest here looks like. Yeah, and that's probably not going to be very helpful at all and probably only just confusing. So you can see, as with local descriptive literature, here we're getting an effort to paint a landscape that you could you could see and understand if you had never been to the place before. And yeah, the goal here is to accurately represent an environment on canvas to, to actually show at this place. This will only continue over time. So by the 1640s and 50s, and I mention that because that's exactly when Sir John Denham is writing Cooper's Hill, you know, you have Claude Lorraine, um, with this almost near photographic, you know, fidelity to reality. This looks like it could be a photograph, right? Um, it's that accurate. And, you know, there is a human presence here, but again, if we were to count the pixels here, it would be, you know, not just fewer than 10%, it would be much less, maybe like 1% or so. So anthropocentric, well, you could argue in a way because the person here is, is kind of central to the scene, but on the other hand, less and less anthropocentric. And another way of putting it, what's this about? It's about the environment. And it's, you know, if you had never visited this part of the world and you're wondering what it was like, someone, you know, put you in front of this painting, that would be pretty helpful. That would be a pretty good way of just, uh, of seeing it. And, and again, you know, you can't rely, so in that case, you couldn't rely on a person having a knowledge of it. You'd have to put in all the details. What do these trees look like? What's the sky like? What's the, the topography like? Is it hilly or whatever? And, and here you have it um, in, in pretty great detail. So this is another Claude Lorraine. More of a human presence here with the buildings here and the bridge and all, but still, um, you know, almost symbolically, if you were to run the visual uh, across the scene, where does your eye fall? This tree is kind of owning this this painting. And, and I think that's increasingly what we're going to see, that the landscape is sort of, you know, uh, front and central of the whole thing. It's, it's there, um, and that's what it's about. And I, again, call this near photographic um, fidelity, and I think it's, uh, it's probably accurate. Um, so, again, notice the human presence here in these three. Huge. I don't know how many pixels these people are taking, but a lot. And clearly, you know, what's foreground in the scene, they, they own this scene. Diminishing here by when we get to um, Bruegel, and then by the time we get to Lorraine, human presence is, is falling by the wayside altogether. And compare that to the Hunt of the Unicorn too, where, again, there's very little effort to paint this as a real forest, and the human um, presence and the human activity is totally dominating that scene. So, as this happens, by the way, not only is the, you know, the percentage of pixels um, for, you know, um, take a photo of those diminishing, but the human presence itself is diminishing. And this is important because it's not all about people. The environment increasingly becomes central. And if you wonder how we got to where we did um, with respect to something like environmentalism and the preservation of, at least in the U.S., the way U.S. parks are preserved, well, sort of coming from this attitude, the notion that the human presence on the scene, in that case, literally should be diminished. In other words, you know, we should not only want to paint something like the Yosemite Valley, we should want to actually make that valley like that by keeping people from living there. And, um, and I know that's a little paradoxical if you've ever been to Yosemite and been in the long lines of people waiting to get in. There's a good bit of a human presence there. But the notion, at least initially, was to keep these 
sort of free from harm from um, people being uh, being there. So as I note here, this question is whether human beings should dominate the earth or not. So in these paintings, human beings are not dominating at all. And the question is, what is the role that human beings should have, especially in like wilderness and all? And the answer here is pretty, comes out pretty loud and clear. It's, it should be a minimal role. So this was a visual way of looking what John Denham brought to poetry. Again, think of him in the era of Claude Lorraine, where we're having what looks almost like a photograph. It's that accurate. And again, if you've never seen the area, you hand them Lorraine's painting, they have a pretty good idea of it. In the same way, you've never seen the view from Cooper's Hill, someone hands you Sir John Denham's poem, Hopefully, if this poet is doing what that painter did, then you'll have a pretty accurate um, description, pretty accurate idea of what's going on there. So from this period on, it will it takes a little while to get going, but certainly by the time we get to the 18th and well into the beginning of the 19th century with Romantic poets, um, this is going to be what they're doing. They're giving us near photographic um, detail in the environment and they're going to spend, you know, it's going to be lush descriptions of the environment. It's going to be in quite detail. And, um, not only will it be more, as I note here, lavish in the sense of a lot of it, but more detailed as well. So none of these later writers are ever going to satisfy themselves saying, you know, it's a, it's a purple partridge or a purple uh, pheasant or a painted partridge. Those one word descriptors are just not going to be accurate. You're going to have to describe in great deal what that is like. And, and they will. And, and if you are familiar with this then, and you were handed two different poems, say one, a few years before Sir John Denham, like De Penshurst, and uh, one sort of in, in the culmination of this tradition with the Romantic poets with Wordsworth, if you knew, if you knew just about how this worked um, and you hadn't seen those poems before, you could probably guess when it was written uh, because one without all the descriptions and just said, you know, purple partridge, a purple pheasant, you would have, you know, you known that this must be from an earlier period. And if you have someone spending, you know, um, lines and lines describing that, that pheasant, well, it's pretty obvious it's from a later period, um, a very, you know, um, lush local descriptive period. To do this from the point of view of a writer, so you have an artist doing it. And yet it almost looks like you have a, it almost looks like a photograph, right? It's like someone just took this picture. Well, if you, if you have, uh, and, and some people, and people will object to this, right? And so as you know, at the end of the 19th century, as photographs are coming on the scene and, and they can do that, it raises a question of what are artists supposed to do, but then artists come up with answers and they come up with great ones, things like impressionism and all, where you're moving away from photographic um, precision. Um, but with writers, it they they have this other challenge of how they do it. And at times they will will approach something like scientific writing. So, you know, if you're and people naturalists when they at the time um, coming after this period in like the 18th and 19th century, you know, when they didn't have photographs and things like that, you know, they would do very careful drawings, but then very careful descriptions as well. What exactly are you looking at when you look at that um, pheasant? What are the feathers like? Can you, can you talk about those feathers, the quality of them? Um, if you're a naturalist and you want to do it, it's kind of the same as it will be for some for some writers, um, poets. So an example would be Henry David Thoreau, especially in his later work after after Walden. Um, he's a naturalist too of sorts, and his descriptions are going to seem almost scientific. And from our modern sensibilities, we might kind of recoil a little from that. In other words, we don't want that from our artist either. If we want a photograph, you'll take a photograph, right? But if you want the artist to be doing something different, well, if you look at someone like Thoreau, you know, if you wanted to read a scientific track, you'd read a scientific track. You want some sort of subjective, in, in, you know, impression here, um, like the impressionists gave to to painting. So, 
Um, it's just something interesting to think about is where descriptive, this local descriptive project will ultimately end up. And it may be something very much akin to scientific writing. But that's not where the end of um, the descriptions and poetry of, of place and the environment will go. It will go differently, too. But in any event, that's where we're going here. So Johnson's Praises of Country Life and Phillips' A Country Life. Both of these are uh, translations of Horace's second epode. Horace was a contemporary of Virgil and Ovid, and I could have well given you his second epode um, back when we did the classical works, when we did the Roman works, because again, he's a contemporary there. But I didn't because I gave you two translations of it to draw attention to what's happening in the period. So again, Johnson's the beginning of the... Um, uh, this 17th century, and Catherine Phillips really in the, the second half. Um, Horace is contemporary of Virgil, and the second epode begins, um, let's just talk about it before the translation, um, giving a sort of a celebration of imagined country life. So here are the opening line. Happy the man. By the way, this then will uh, inaugurate a genre of literature, a poetry called the happy man um, poetry and this is the, the first one happy the man who far from business cares like the pristine race of mortals works his ancestral acres with his steers from all money lending free pretty pastoral here right and there's even a um, you know a note here to the pristine race of mortals so it's not even the golden age but the golden race which goes back to Hesiod and obviously Horace would have known that and you know there's no business here this is a life characterized by otium and you know um, the shift here if there's any away from classical pastoral there are steers here rather than sheep but other than that pretty pastoral and certainly money doesn't come on the scene it's a conspicuous feature of pastoral we haven't really talked about but yeah it's not about money this is this is something um, supposed be far nicer than that. But at the end, we have a totally different ending. So when the money lender Alpheus had uttered this, on the very point of beginning the farmer's lace, he called in all his funds by the end of the month, and the next month seeks to put them out again. So what's going on here? Well, um, Horace is having, is having fun with us because this thing that reads like a pastoral poem, and it is a celebration of the countryside, we realize at the end that it's written by a city dweller and in fact a money lender and named Alpheus. And he wants to go out and live the farmer's life and he's ready to do it. He calls in all his money. So he take his money and I guess buy a farm or work a farm or whatever. But then he decides not to do it and puts all his money out again. So what's going on here? Well, Horace is well aware of the fact that pastoral, as we've discussed, is an urban genre written by people in the city, idealizing the countryside. So you might think this is an accurate representation of the countryside, as many people have a pastoral, but this poem won't let you won't let you do that because at the end it says this is not an accurate representation at all. This is an ideal representation by a city dweller and a very crass one at that, this you know, moneylender named Alpheus. So so it's very clear that, you know, Horace knows that pastoral is this urban form that is not in any way accurately describing the environment. And it's, it's interesting because this is 2,000 years ago. Uh, writers may have known this, and Horace certainly did, but that didn't stop pastoral from being continued to be written and pastoral paintings and all to be done um, because it was just such a popular genre. But people were well aware of this fact for a long time. So um, it's interesting then that Horace will get translated the second epode during this period. Um, you know, to spell it out here, he's fully aware of the fact that the notion of the countryside represented in pastoral is is not only, you know, not accurate, you know, there really isn't a locus aminus, but that it's culturally constructed, that it's created in 
principally from the vantage point of the city. And Horace, of course, takes great joy in making a parody of that here. The fact that, you know, this is not accurate at all. You might read the beginning of it and think it's perfectly accurate and want to buy into it. But Horace, uh, for his part, won't let you do that. That's, that's arguably the point of the poem. He, I would imagine he didn't sit down saying, I'm going to write a pastoral poem and make it beautiful. He sat down saying, I'm going to tell the world that, that pastoral is this culturally constructed um, you know, urban art form, and we need to see it as such. It's, it's a great project, by the way, right? And, and it shows a very perceptive understanding of pastoral. Um, so Johnson, writing in the beginning of the 17th century, does a translation of the second epode, and it's a very literal translation. It's a line-by-line -line translation. It ends with the ending just as it is. And in part, this is convention at the time that, that translations would be very literal rather than taking some license and elaborating on it. But I could have, you know, if I had assigned past, if I had assigned Horace's epode, a second epode earlier on in the class, I could have very well given you Johnson's translation because it's a pretty accurate one. Um, and again, it's word by word, line by line, trying to be as literal and as faithful to the original as possible. But then um, you have Catherine Phillips writing in 1667, and this is, you know, a few decades later she actually leaves off the ending. It's a highly stylized translation which fails to reveal that is actually a parody of, the, of pastoral. So what's going on there? Um, Catherine Phillips is clearly aware that the public, the people she's writing for, like pastoral. They like buying into this fantasy of the countryside. And she has a great fantasy of it because, hey, the beginning of the second an epode is pretty good pastoral and she thinks it's worthy of translation and and also as an aside we saw this already at the beginning of the 17th century with amelia lanyer you have a new group of women coming on the scene educate it you're able to translate out of other languages, uh, both Catherine Phillips and Amelia Lanier do Latin, for example, and are, and are quite comfortable doing it. So this is new. It, th is this mass education for women? No, that's not going to come to the middle of the um, 19th century, but it is a new breed of women coming on this women coming on the scene and and made possible through education i mean it's it's all education all the time really that bring, makes that happen but in any event um catherine phillips is very savvy and she's giving the audience what they want and she's taking off that ending because it's not consistent with with pastoral in that sense. So let's look at um, Catherine Phillips's uh, country life in a little more detail. By the way, right there, the title, right? It's a country life. She really wants to tell, wants to make the argument that this is life in the country, that this is what it's about. So again, in like in terms of local descriptive of this project of, you know, closing your eyes and imagining what the country is like, well, Catherine Phillips is trying to give that to you. Yep. Um, Catherine Phillips, another one of these people you may have never heard of. And, and again, you know, scholars have focused on different things over the years, but fortunately in recent decades, feminist scholars have, have, you know, brought attention to scholar, to writers and artists of all sorts, thinkers of all sorts that we had previously ignored. Turns out Catherine Phillips is the most popular woman writer of the 17th century. I say that with confidence because it's true, even though her career, you know, even though there are a lot of other people, it's a long century, but in England, uh, she is absolutely the most popular. Um, how did she get to be so popular? Well, she's very, I would argue, savvy in knowing just what to say and what not to say. So she's a woman in the period. Um, she's a new, I would argue, sort of a new breed of woman coming on the scene. And yet she knows what to say and what not to say. So she writes, for example, a poem, Celebration of Motherhood. Why? Because that's what the audience wanted. That's what people wanted to imagine women as, as, you know, loving mothers, as nurturing and all. That was the perception of women. And Catherine Phillips, in, to large measure to some of these things, stays with that perception. They have been very different in her personal life. And if you're interested in someone's personal life, uh, an early feminist writer, um, Catherine Phillips is an interesting one to look at and her circle of friends and all. But 
in her public in the public sphere um, generally the overall perception is that she she you know is a popular writer because she writes about what's popular and all it's not entirely uh, if you're a savvy reader a careful reader you'll see things there that I think the public would have looked over but if um, you know you weren't careful. You would just buy into it. So a modern example, you may not know this, but uh, a song by Bruce Springsteen called Born in the USA, which is incredibly popular with people who are, you know, patriotic and flag waving and everything because, you know, it's it's about a Vietnam veteran and, you know, people just love to buy into this. If you actually look at the lyrics of that song, and Bruce Springsteen is very clear about this, it's an, it's an enormous critique of life in America and how we failed, you know, Vietnam veterans. And it's not in any way a celebration of America, even though people love to play that song during physical celebrations, you know, Fourth of July and all of America. It's a biting critique of America and the American way of life. Of course, I mean the U.S. here. Catherine Phillips can be read that way too, but for the most part, she's presenting what people want it to, um, to hear. And, and, and it also, um, it's a constructed view of a woman and a femininity that the public felt comfortable with. There were other people at the time, and I mentioned one Margaret Cavendish here, that challenged everything. Uh, Margaret Cavendish, um, another brilliant writer of the period, contemporary, and uh, Margaret Cavendish had the benefit of education, and um, when her husband died, the benefit of was a rather small fortune that allowed her to do things like self-publish. She didn't have to answer to anyone. She didn't care what the public thought because she could publish all the books she wanted. She could afford to do it. And she was, you know, at the time considered, and it's, it's interesting, people have, have obviously spent a lot of time commenting on this, because she pushed the boundary and all, people thought that there was something wrong with her, that she was actually insane. And she would do things like, you know, dress in very lavish clothing. And she tried to get entry to the Royal Society, which is the, you know, the premier scientific community at the time, which is emerging as the premier scientific community on the planet. Um, you know, she wanted to get in because she wanted to be part of that. And, you know, there was created all sorts of um, hubbub, but she tried and all. But Catherine Phillips um, didn't do anything like that. Catherine and Phillips towed the line. Margaret Cavendish, yeah, she challenged everything right and left. I mean, she writes a, a utopian story and it's about an empress who, you know, rules the world and is fashioned on her, of course. And she's absolutely wonderful. But Catherine Phillips is different than that. This is giving the audience what they wanted and, and knowing what the audience wanted. And she understood that at this time, you know, attitudes toward the environment were changing and she wanted to to, um, to buy into that. What did they want? Well, you know, London growing. And also note that um, I mentioned in passing Cooper's Hill, you know, written about the British Civil War, all sorts of turmoil in the world and the country. And remember way back um, when we had pastoral, I gave you that painting of the South um, and at, right around the before, a little before the Civil War um, by Brown and, and how perfect it was and, and all. And it didn't show at all what the situation really was in the rural, pa uh, you know, South in the United States where, you know, human beings were forced into, you know, abject slavery. And in the same way, you know, Catherine Phillips wants to give this sort of romanticized view of the countryside and of life, even though the world is kind of in turmoil at the time. So, um, you know, Horace Johnson and Phillips, by way of, you know, understood that the contemporary countryside, you know, um, as a locus aminus was culturally constructed. But the difference is uh, that she knew that, you know, faced with increasing environmental devastation and other problems, her readers wanted to imagine a perfect countryside. So that's what she gave them. Um, she knew that wasn't the reality. I mean, she, she clearly, you know, she translated Horace's second epoch. She knew what that ending meant, and, and she knew why she had to excise it from her translation, because it just wouldn't fit into this idealized picture. She's important because as literature progresses, that's going to be modern. That's going to become what will become modern by the 19th century environmental literature. It's the celebration of the countryside and eliminating anything else, um, the way she eliminates that ending. 
Um, she describes life there in the countryside as utterly perfect. She actually has to bring things into Horace that aren't there. So, you know, what are the country folk like? Well, it's, no one rules over anyone else. In other words, everyone gets along. There's no, you know, tyrant here or anything. No one en envies everyone else's wealth. Well, wait, what? When does this happen in human history exactly? You know, wealth has always been this thing that people have made a show of and envied. And certainly Ben Johnson knows that because he wrote all about that in the beginning of To Penshurst. Um, but even more, so as the vegetarian diet is becoming a thing in England, um, Phillips adds, well, you know, these people were vegetarian too. It's not only that they didn't do violence to each other, they, they didn't eat animals and do violence to them. Um, they live in simple little cottages. So um, the idea of what Ben Johnson starts that we should live in more modest homes and certainly not trophy homes. But here we're getting to what you know Thoreau is actually going to, to do as a lifestyle, live in a simple cottage. Um, and they are in every way opposed to the city and the state. So if you thought that maybe in the countryside some of the problems of the city would sort of leak out into the countryside, Catherine Phillips says, no, not at all. This is a perfect place. Um, you know, and what to get all this in, incidentally, so she leaves off the ending, so she saves a few lines there, but her translation is actually longer than a literal translation like Ben Johnson's. And why? Because she actually adds 20 more lines to the poem. This is not a literal translation. This is a very broad interpretation where she has to add lines to do it, to add things in, for example, like they're vegetarian. There's no opportunity to do that in the in the literal translation because, well, it's just not there in Horace. But the Catherine Phillips, knowing what people are increasingly thinking in the 17th century, she gives them what they want. And as people are beginning to think about vegetarianism, um, she throws it in here um, for that. And as people are beginning to, you know, be concerned about consumerism and the exploitation of people, um, you know, she has this you know, as a place where no one envied other ones well. So um, it's a fascinating project. It's it's not, I mean, is it a translation? Yes, but it's an enormously interpretive translation uh, with a great deal of detail at it. Yep. And um, Phillips then, and you can see it coming out of, of Sir John Denham, but with Phillips, and she's just writing really a decade or two after, but she actually gets it all right in the sense that I would argue she's really, as I do here, a harbinger, beginner of what's uh, an early example of what's to come. Um, and that is the fetishization of the environment. So when you write about the environment, do you talk about problems and all? No, you ignore the problems and you talk about idealized things. Many nature poets, and Wordsworth is always going to be your touchstone here, will, will not only celebrate the country, but actually so buy into this vision that they move out there themselves and they encourage a literal move toward the countryside. And Wordsworth lamented this, as I noted here at the end of his life, because he, starting with a, um, with a, a guide to the region that he wrote early in his career, he, he celebrated the Lake District, which if you go there and visit it, it's quite beautiful, of course. Um, but then he did such a good job of it that he encouraged people to actually want to move out there or at least come out as tourists and and um, they were doing that in large numbers and Wordsworth got even more concerned because they were going to build a rail line out that would bring them out in even greater numbers, which they ultimately did. And Wordsworth went and wrote a, um, uh, a scathing article or a pretty powerful article in a local newspaper saying, you know, why this rail line shouldn't be built and why it wouldn't be good. But clearly, you know, where does all this begin? The celebration of the countryside, the belief that it's this incredibly perfect place. Well, it's been brewing for a while, but by the time you get to someone like Catherine Phillips, yeah, it's, it's there fully formed and it will then, you know, sort of characterize what comes next with nature poetry. So again, we're reading her, not that she's a missing link somehow, but that she is a major part of the evolution of what will become modern nature poetry. And if you were to talk about all the different features of nature poetry and put a list together, yeah, you'd check quite a few boxes with Catherine Phillips, I think.
So another person to think about here is John Milton, Paradise Lost. Uh, I know two dates here because Milton wrote um, the first edition in 1667 where it actually had 10 books and then wrote a different version. They published a different version in 1674 as 12 books, which is what generally we read nowadays. And Paradise Lost is the most important long poem in the 17th century. Some people would argue um, the greatest long poem ever written in the English language. And yeah, they're definitely contenders to that. Um, Walt Whitman's Song of Myself, big contender. But um, Paradise Lost, certainly a phenomenal poem and certainly a, um, a very popular poem at the time. So it's um, you know the story here. You know the, you know, if you were to plot out the basic um, story, it's the first three books, principally, of Genesis, which you read. And as you know, not very long. Milton, however, takes those three books and expands them into over 10,000 words of poetry. And he does a lot in that and things we won't talk about. So I note here that he provides a very radical view of scripture. Some people would argue heretical. Um, it probably was actually because Milton wrote another longer document, long document called on uh, Christian doctrine, explaining all his views on Christianity, and he didn't publish that because it would have been heretical and he might have been imprisoned or killed because of it. But this is why literature is so interesting as a, um, a form of social critique, because you can say pretty much the same thing, and Milton does in large measure say the same thing in Paradise Lost, but leave it up when for interpretation so that you can sort of back away from having written something heretical, even though if you interpret the work in the way that Milton, I think, would like you to, all those conclusions would be reached anyhow. Because um, he talks about the Trinity, free will, the nature of God, nature of women. I mean, Milton does not buy into this view that dominated Christian thinking for most of its history about women being temptresses and evil and, and Eve being the source of all sin in the world. Milton, as much as he can, working with the material that he has, won't buy into that. Yes, you know, the fall happens because of what Eve did, but it's not because she was a temptress. It's not because of sex and all in Milton's view. Um, and he, he goes with a host of topics, but what we're interested in is just environmentally what he has to say. Um, Milton's Eden is definitely a locus aminas. Um, you know, it's, 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 as Milton would depict it as wonderful garden as he can imagine. Um, but remember in Genesis three seventeen and 19, the, um, the punishment that Adam suffers is that he has to work and uh, doing Georgic labor. So every account of Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden prior to Milton did not have them doing anything in the garden because it was thought that labor, remember that you know both Adam and Eve have different kinds of labor as punishment for the fall, that that male labor of, of, of farming, agriculture, of gardening, was only a consequence of the fall. Um, but Milton has them gardening throughout the, um, his description of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And uh, he does that in part because, remember, he's coming after Amelia Lanyer, who really you know, firmly introduced the idea of Christian stewardship. Milton wants to make clear that the original you know, role of human beings on earth before the fall, when everything was going just fine, they hadn't done any evil, was to take care of the planet. That's what they do. And they, they take it very seriously. And and again, you know, um, in, in Christian thinking, often women were, were seen as inferior in the pejorative descriptions and all. Milton's different because the, of the pair, it's very clear, people have argued, I've argued, Eve is the one who does most of the work. Eve is the one who understands gardening, who understands you know how to take care of plants and animals, is most sympathetic and most caring and most effective in doing so. So um, Milton is clearly in this Christian stewardship model, that that's the basic human role on earth is to take care of earth. Think about what I just said as an environmental ethic, and that's really important. If everyone on the planet believed with what Milton said, that the role of human beings on the planet, first and foremost, is to take care of the planet, I think we'd be living in a very different era right now, and we'd have a very different attitude towards something like continuing with the practices that are bringing about global climate change. 
Um, Eve is portrayed really as a genus Loki, as a protector of place. Her the portrayal is that strong. And she you knows she nurses the plant, she sees the, the beauty of Eden, she protects it from nightly ills. By the way, I'm literally going through Milton here. Um, she gets up with morning haste, she visits all her plants in her domain. And um, even though she's spiritually attendant, I mean she listens to the um, the stories, uh, the explanation of the universe that Raphael is telling Adam. She's not actually there, but she um, makes a point of always going and, and listening in on what's going on. So she's concerned with spiritual matters, but boy, she's really caring about the place. So it's not just that Milton says she's, you know, caring. He depicts her as a genus Loki, as someone who cares very much for the place. And in, in terms of, of Amelia Lanyer, the notion that that homosocial group of women took care of the place, took care of the um, estate at Cookham, well, Eve really takes care of the earth. I mean, it's Milton wants to be very clear that it's not only that she has this sort of obligation to take care of the the earth, but she's really serious about it and very effective and, and good at it. And often when Adam's off listening to Raphael and concerned about, you know, ecclesiastical religious things and all, Eve is out there doing the job of, of taking care of the earth. Um, Milton is useful for other reasons. Um, Milton is a monist, and he makes clear that this existed in Christianity, if a minority. Um, you know, you know, we had from the very beginning this dualism that Christians are seen as this two-part being, having a soul and having a body or a spirit and flesh, as it's often called. Um, to Milton, that's not the case. We are not dualistic beings. We are one type of being. We are one thing, all. Um, he acknowledged that there is a spiritual aspect and an earthly aspect of us, but that's just two aspects. We might, if you're a monist today, you might say the same. You can have spiritual inclinations, but that doesn't change the fact that you're an embodied human being. Um, Milton goes first, it goes further in saying that that's actually, the monism is the way the universe is constructed. So again, we had way back when we had, you know, Plato and all, and the Hebrew Testament, the notion that there is this, well, it isn't the Hebrew Testament, but the notion that there is this metaphysical realm, heaven, and that there is another one, you know, the earth, and there's also another one, hell. Uh, Milton said, yeah, but they're all matter. It's all the same. There is no different realm. It is the same thing. All matter is the same. All matter, you know, angels are composed of the same matter as human beings. Milton talks a lot about angels. Um, his award, the war in heaven, is depicted at the beginning of the epic. But he is not in any way, he will not buy into dualism. Everything is the same. It is the same thing. We are one matter, same as angels and all. There, there's a difference in how it's composed and all, but um, like, you know, I, I guess if Milton were to talk about it this way, like how the molecules were, so angels are a slightly different substance. You know, you could you could run a, you could try to, and this is a problem in the war in heaven, you could try to cut an angel with a sword and the sword would go right through them. Um, but they're still matter in the same way, more of an ephemeral kind of thing, but still matter. So, um, Milton argues, in, and especially in later works, so he has another, uh, a couple works after this, but an important one is Paradise Regained. And in that one, he says, he makes it clear, he thinks that this whole dualism thing is actually not part of Christianity in his view. This is inherited from Greco-Roman thinking. He believes that his position of monism is the right interpretation of the Bible. And that then is, I mean, it's, it's a pretty shocking thing to say. Other, other people have said it, and well, after him say it, but it, it just sort of, you know, uh, um, blows a hole in dualism and all the problems that comes with it. So it's no longer that we should, you know, want to be in heaven with God and all, because um, I'll explain heaven in a moment here. He actually, has a pretty radical thing to say about that. Um, but the most, probably the most, one of the most famous lines in Paradise Lost is written by Satan, who says the mind is its own place and in itself can make heaven, uh, um, heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. 
Um, this is really Milton putting into Satan's mouth the words of um, contemporary philosophers like Rene Descartes, um, who were very much dualists, who said that, you know, the mind is so separate that the body doesn't even matter. You know, it doesn't matter where you are. It can matter in the most, you can be in the most horrible place on the planet. And um, at, nonetheless, what will happen is, you know, your mind will be able to transport itself away from it. Why? Because it's not connected with the body and all. But by the end of Paradise, by the time um, Satan gets um to Eden and all, he realized that you can't escape it, you know, that f idea of mind and all, he brings hell with them everywhere. And the notion that the body can pull, uh, uh, the mind can pull free of the body on earth, you know, um, is, is something that Milton just doesn't think is ultimately possible. So um, to Milton, and the reason for this is to Milton, um, you do not reside in your body. In other words, you are not a soul that is in your body. To dualistic thinkers, that kind of sums it up. And when you die, the soul would leave the body. So it's just in there. And, and people like Descartes in Milton's era were very interested in trying to figure out how that worked. And he actually said you had a little part of your brain um, that was the connection between the soul and the body, that that was sort of like the, in modern computer terms, the interface that happened. Um, yeah, Milton doesn't believe that. He doesn't think you're in your body. He, you, you are your body. It's, it's totally connected, you know. And Milton would go further, and it's important environmentally. Um, he doesn't think that you just live in a place in the sense that you're like here and can go away. He thinks that you are a place. And, and that makes sense, right? The food that you eat and all, if you grew up in a certain place, you're kind of made out of that place. You're made out of the plants there and all and everything. And you're, you're deeply connected. And, and he saw that bond as essentially spiritual, that you're spiritually connected to the place. And, and his um, way of explaining that and what it would be like, if you're like, what does that mean to be connected spiritually to this place? Read Eve. Read about Eve in the epic because she is the, you know, um, uh, really connected. Um, and, you know, he, he would erase the boundary between mind and, and place, you know what I mean? The, the idea of the mind is its own place and all, be it hell, heaven, or earth. Um, so we, like, Milton's Eve, according to, to uh, Milton, you know, we, we are at the place that we live in. It's that connected. And, and this is a, a crucial idea that will come, you know, roaring into the uh, um, people like Thoreau, who basically quotes Milton in this way, saying that, you know, he talks about the, the universe being this interconnected, the earth being this interconnected thing. Um, and so you can see Milton's comparison to Dunn here. Dunn says the world's but a carcass and we should forget about it. You know, Milton believes in a regenerative era that is actually going to happen on earth. And so when Dunn says, you know, the other people are saying or, or thinking about the carcass's last resurrection, the earth will be resurrected. And I mentioned that there were people at the time actually thinking about it. Milton's one. Milton is not giving up on the earth. It's not going to be, you know, hadn't, didn't reach a tipping point years before. But in fact, it's going to regenerate, he says, if we take care of it. And I mentioned that this mentioned back then with Dunn that this debate continues um, with someone like James Dobson, who's, you know, arguing that, you know, we shouldn't take global warming seriously coming from a religious perspective, a Christian perspective, because in his view, a tipping point had been reached 6,000 years before. But people like Al Gore and Pope Francis are clearly um, coming out of Milton's tradition. Not that they're monists per se. I don't. It would, I don't think it would be possible for Pope Francis to stick with conventional uh, church thinking and be a monist. But they are very much of the mind coming from Amelia Lanier, which Milton inherits as well. That we need to be stewards of the planet. And that the planet is not lost, that it's not in a state of irretrievable decay, but ultimately it can be saved with human beings as well. Uh, they're not weighing in on that exactly, and they're not saying that at the second coming the earth will be saved. That would involve a good bit of interpretation of the Bible, and especially um, the last book of the Christian Testament, John's Revelation. But they are very much in the mind that um, human beings can um, ultimately have a major role in, in taking care of the earth, like Milton's Eve, to the to the extent that we could actually, you know, save the earth. And and it's important theologically because that's the way the Milton imagines Eve, in that. 
yes, she did what precipitated the fall. She brought it about. Again, to Milton, it's not because of sexual temptation or anything. Still, it's on Eve's shoulders. But then you see Eve doing the best thing that she can do, the only thing that she can do, which is to try to undo what she did. And, and she does that by caring for the earth right away. She, she realizes it, and she, she, she actually gets a shock in Book 11, which we don't read when she realizes she's actually going to be taken away from the, um, the garden, and, and that, that fills her with incredible dread. But, because, but she doesn't know that, and it's sort of unfair she didn't know that. But what she does then is the only thing that she can do after the fall, which is to try to undo what she did and take care of her planet, or at least the little part that she occupies with the garden. And you can see why that is so environmentally significant. If you're coming in Christian thinking, coming out of Christian thinking the way that Milton is, then, well, what can we do now? I mean, the fall has happened, sin is in the world, there's nothing that can be done. The only thing that can be done in Milton's view, and he is the wonderful exemplar of the, the ethic, is to try to repair what we did to try to take care of this planet as best we can and try to make it better than it was before. That's a remarkable Christian environmental ethic that is, is not quite there before Milton. But again, it'll come roaring into the, um, into the, to the future, to our present with folks like Prince, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Pope Francis and Al Gore. Okay, well, that's it for today. We have a little more to do in the Renaissance before moving to more modern period with Thoreau and all. So take care and I'll see you next time.